Half-Life, Quantum Physics, Chaos Theory. Half-Life is one of the most fascinating worlds in gaming. The narrative elements crossing into the gameplay was something the world had never seen before. It would change the way that in-game cinematic sequences would unfold. What makes the storytelling in Half-Life so incredible in tandem with its gameplay is the science behind it from development to delivery. Chaos is the one very key element in how the entire saga of the Black Mesa incident unfolds, also known as the butterfly effect. If a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, does it set off a tornado in Texas? The chaos theory or butterfly effect can simply be defined as the dependence on conditions in which a small change in one state of a nonlinear system can result in large differences in a later state. This is an exploration of the intricate dance with chaos theory within Half-Life. Part one, a butterfly's wings. Without chaos theory, we wouldn't have the masterful lore of Half-Life we have today. And it all centers around one mysterious character, the G-Man. It doesn't really matter who G-Man is. In fact, knowing exactly who he is would effectively dilute the mystery we are drawn to within the franchise. The more important aspect of G-Man is what is he doing throughout. Let's start off with the normal state of dependence. Black Mesa inbound. Here, everything is normal as we fade into the transit system. No butterfly has flapped its wings as of yet, but this changes almost instantaneously, which is part of the brilliance of this opening sequence. So where does it all go downhill? Where is the butterfly, and when does it flap its wings? Well, right about here. From the transit system, if we look to the left, G-Man can be spotted. If we look to the front, we are presented with the first signs of a disaster, a toxic spill. This seemingly aesthetic choice is actually a moment of foreshadowing. There is a notion in chaos theory that if a being existed, and that being knew the position of all existing atoms and every potential position in which they could exist, then this being would exist in a place where past and future are in the very present. In other words, everything in all of space and time would be predetermined. Everything except what might happen to that being. This being is known as Laplace's demon. Morning, Mr. Freeman. As Gordon enters the anomalous materials lab, we learn of a security guard named Barney, who is also late. We then learn of a blackout, which erased all messages for Gordon and is causing problems throughout the facility. As we travel through the lab and prepare for our job at hand, Gordon. we meet up with Dr. Kleiner and Eli. I'm glad you're here. Shortly thereafter, a system behind them overloads and explodes. Oh, it's about to go crazy. All signs point to disaster, but these signs are all pre-programmed, and no matter how many times we play the game, these signs are inevitably ignored, leading us to the test chamber, and thusly, our preordained fate to push the sample into the anti-mass spectrometer. Chaos ensues, and nothing will ever be the same.
Part 2. The Chicken or the Egg In further expansions and sequels to Half-Life, we learn more and more about how everything was intertwined, further reinforcing G-Man's insidious role in the entire event. He is there when Adrian Shepard reports for duty. He is there when Barney is locked out of the security room. He is there when Dr. Cross and Dr. Green go to retrieve the sample for Gordon. It is evident that G-Man is tampering with things here and there in order to control the path of chaos which unfolds. At first, this appears to only affect Black Mesa. But we soon learn that the Resonance Cascade has changed the entire fate of Earth. And furthermore, the universe, space-time itself, and every parallel dimension in between. The G-Man is impossible to miss in Half-Life 2 and Half-Life Alex. However, we still never truly know who he is or who he works for. Or do we? Chaos Theory is all about asking questions and exploring minor details. Realistically, the answer to all of these questions is that the decisions were made due to developmental issues and maneuvering around them. There are many questions we can infer from the introduction sequence. What would have happened if Gordon wasn't late? Why was he late in the first place? What would have happened if Gordon was sick that day and never showed up at all? Would somebody else have pushed the sample into the anti-mass spectrometer? The more we experiment with these notions, the more restricted we find ourselves as Gordon Freeman. It is our fate as the player to participate in these preordained events. But is everything truly preordained? Part 3. Developing Chaos Half-Life itself isn't simply about chaos theory. In fact, it wasn't about chaos theory until Mark Laidlaw entered the picture and began to integrate the game mechanics and development into the storytelling process. We'll write the whole story. It's because it's a conspiracy plot. Everybody knows more about it than you do, so you don't have to do, you don't have to answer those questions. You just keep raising questions and make the mystery kind of thing. The game's development was marked by uncertainty, unexpected challenges, and bold creative choices. Half-Life was originally being created using the Quake engine. Later on, Valve created the Gold Source engine, which would prove to be one of the most beneficial decisions made in development. From the decision to move to this game engine, to the decision to tell the story without traditional cutscenes, chaos reigned in the development process. Interestingly, the chaos theory within the development process had a direct impact on the chaos theory within the game itself. The unpredictability within the developmental phases would bleed into the narrative, creating a game world that feels alive and constantly in flux. While the game presents us with the illusion of free choice, this path would never have existed in the first place without free choice in how the game was being made. There are two endings to the original Half-Life. This was one of the early first-person shooter games that presented us with an alternate ending. The player is presented with a choice at the end of the game. But this choice is a default mechanism. In other words, it does not matter what decisions you make throughout the game in order to have these options available. What does matter is that the choice is presented to you at the end of the game. This is proof that indeed, the G-Man is flapping the butterfly's wings. And that is where the answer reveals itself. Chaos theory within Half-Life is controlled. This is a paradox, a quantum concept. When the glass hits the floor and begins to shatter, the moment of chaos is the split second when the glass hits the floor and can only exist within that small fraction of time. As the glass cracks and physics determines the directions in which the pieces shall fly, chaos no longer exists 
and is controlled by nature. If a conscious life form can determine the time, angle, and direction in which the glass falls, one is practicing the ability to sway or control how the chaos unfolds. G-Man and his briefcase do just that. And Gordon? Gordon represents every free man. He is the way the glass will fall. Free will and choice determine how all things will end. While the player is meant to feel in control of the outcome, the truth is, they were never in control. Everything was preordained by the developers. Preordained by G-Man. Hmm. Preordained. Laplace's demon. Ah. Oh. There you are. So is freedom an illusion? Or do we simply need to understand the code of this matrix in order to slip in and out of that control? Full circle. A closed loop. Nothing can be controlled except the choices that we make. Whether we choose to play the game the developers intended, or expose the flaws within the code and speedrun the game in 17 minutes. There is no free will in Half-Life until you crack the source code, and then you are the one flapping the butterfly's wings. Final thoughts. How has Half-Life affected us? Where did that lead? What has changed because you are watching this video right now? What if I never made this video in the first place? What will happen to us if you don't subscribe? Half-Life is more than a game. But then again, this is all simply theoretical. Let's go east of the Rockies. You're on Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hi. Hi, George. Yes, sir. Hi. My name is uh, Gordon. I'm, uh, I'm a theoretical physicist. I work at a research facility. And uh, something very mystical has been happening to me so far. Um, there's this man. He, I'll describe him. He looks the same every day, and he's been stalking me. He's a middle-aged man in a blue-tinged suit, and he has very pale skin with dark hair, and he always carries a briefcase. Hmm. And whenever I see him, he, he always he seems to adjust his tie and, and brush himself off, and I've never seen him up close. And the mystical thing about it is that whenever I see him, he's always in a place I can access, such as another room blocked off by, by a window or down the hallway or on the other side of a door or walking across a catwalk. And when I try to get to his place, I say if I see him on uh, down a uh, long hallway right. and run there, he's gone. And the, the most, the weirdest thing was yesterday. I uh, wanted to get uh, access to this room, um, and I wanted to go to the short way, so I tried to open this door. He was on the other side. I saw him through the window, and he locked the door on the other side. And I had to go the long way around, and he was gone. And the only way that he could have left was go my way or through the door, but the door was still locked from that side. Now, um, I and a colleague, a friend of mine who's in security named Barney, uh, we call him the G-Man, and most of my other colleagues will not even, I think they must know of this man, but they do not mention him. I can see it in their eyes when I talk to them about it that there's some type of fear. You think he's like a government worker? Oh, I was thinking that's why we call him the G-Man. He looks like it. Uh, he... He has a suit. Uh, no, no personality, right? No personality. Uh, well, he has a very blank face on him. And, I mean, he, it seems he always has this tick of uh, adjusting his tie and and hmm. uh, what, brushing his coat off. Are you working, your theoretical physicist, are you yes. working on anything that you can tell us about? That he uh, would want to get information about? Yes, yes. You are. Um, we're working on portal technology. Now, tell me about that portal technology. I'm afraid the, I, I cannot is, go Is this the ability it. to travel? Yes. Through other worlds? And, yes. And we're in heavy competition with another company, but I can't really get into how that close, right now. How close are we to getting this done, you think? I cannot say. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I just started a few months ago, and I'm 
I, basically, I just my level is uh, basically assisting the uh, okay. senior uh, scientist. Well, have you jeopardized yourself by coming on this program tonight? No, I have not. All right, I haven't said anything so important. He has this man threatened you or anything like that? He has never t spoken to me. I've never heard his voice. I've never seen him up. The closest I've ever seen him was the other side of that door. He's never really been in the same room as me. But I, he's always seems to be stalking me. Top, top management has got to know he's there. Uh, yes. Do you go through heavy security? Yes, very so, heavy security. So he gets in, right? Yeah, he. I, I thought he. Uh, uh, when I started, I thought I thought he was the administrator, but I met Mr. Breen, and he he's certainly not him. He looks very very different. Uh, he talks to me frequently, and, and every day he's there. This guy. Uh, mostly every day, not every day, but um, some days it's he. I see him more. Some days I see him less. But he, I once was working on something at my desk, and I just got up, and he was just, he walked right by my door. I ran outside, and he was gone. All right. Well, you keep us uh, up to date on this as much as you can. Portal technology, the ability to travel to other worlds, just like the movie Contact. That's pretty fascinating.